you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the, world. in the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. <laughs> Hi, folks. This is Voss here from the Chris Voss Show.com. The Chris Voss Show.com. Hey, we're coming to you with another podcast. Oh, my God. It's another podcast. We're getting close to the end of the year. We have just the most incredible guests coming to you. And I think you're going to uh, enjoy what we have to offer today. In the meantime, to see the video version of this, go to YouTube.com, which says Chris Voss. Uh, also, go to thecvpn.com. You subscribe to all nine podcasts over there. You can also go to goodreads.com, which says Chris Voss, and uh, follow me over there. You'll see all the books we're reviewing, reading, uh, and all that good stuff. You can also go to facebook.com the chris voss show and uh, follow us over there and see all the things we're talking about in there on top of that there's multiple groups on facebook if you search for them, multiple groups on uh, linkedin there's a giant 135,000 group on linkedin check that out over there lots of c-class brilliant people as well and this episode is brought to you by ifi audio and their new neo IDSD. The Neo is the new wave of digital sound listening for your desktop, music, gaming, and bleeding edge Bluetooth, even MQA audio file decoding. Uh, we're using it in the studio right now. I've loved my experience with it so far. It just makes everything sound so much more richer and better and takes things to the next level. IFI Audio is an award winning audio tech company with one aim in mind to improve your music enjoyment of quality sound, eradicate noise distortion, and hiss from your listening experience. Check out their new incredible lineup of DAX and audio enhancement devices at ifi-audio.com. Today, we have a couple of gentlemen on the uh, show and one gentleman who has actually made a prior appearance for his other book. Uh, the title of the book that they have written is Money From Nothing or Why We Should Stop Worrying About Debt and Learn to Love the Federal Reserve book is written by Robert Hockett and Aaron James. Welcome to the show, guys. How are you? Hey, hey fine, Chris. Thanks. Good to be with you. Awesome yeah. sauce. It's yeah. good to see you guys again. Aaron was here with his book uh, on assholes uh, and stuff like that. I don't know. That sounds really subjective. Like he was talking about colons, but it was a book about uh, just assholes in public, correct? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so you can google that on the chris voss show along with the 700 other shows that we have on there be sure to l l l read them all over christmas or listen to them all uh so guys let me have you, have you guys introduce each, uh, yourselves and give us your bio rundowns great um well i guess we can go alphabetical um so robert hockett i am a professor of, of law at cornell and of finance at georgetown's mcdonough school of uh, business that reflects the fact that I'm sort of back and forth between New York City and D.C. Um, and the reason I'm in D.C. a lot is I do a fair bit of work uh, consultative and uh, legislative drafting wise for various uh, Congress members. And before that, uh, background at the New York Fed and the IMF. And before that, a background in, in philosophy, which is one of the ways that Aaron and I came to know each other. There you go. Yeah. And so me, I'm Aaron James and a professor of philosophy at UC Irvine. And um, uh, for a long time, I've worked on sort of the intersection between philosophy, uh, political philosophy and economics, and then and, and then eventually got much more interested in money, money and, and finance um, and, and public finance. And then so this this book reflects uh, reflects like the collaboration with with Bob about how to put a bunch of different ideas together from philosophy, from law, from finance, from, you know, current problems and. And, you know, um, and package it all together so we can all understand it. And uh, you guys wrote this book, Money from Nothing. Uh, what motivated you guys to want to both get together and write this book? I think there are a couple things, maybe. Um, so, first of all, um, I had reached out to Aaron in connection with this Assholes book uh, because I had been kind of thinking for a bit uh, on a, about a big project that I was uh, imagining sort of unfolding over time. I was thinking of it as the Asshole Proof Governance uh, Project, the idea to come up with ways of basically structural means of sort of screening out or avoiding or quarantining 
uh, assholes in various forms of organization at various sort of levels, you might say, of political organization, you know, from small companies all the way up to uh, an entire national uh, government. Um, and, you know, Aaron's book it made it clear that he was, you know, you know, way ahead of anybody else when it came to sort of dealing with the asshole problem. I, I was aware of Mr. Sutton's book, of course, The No Asshole Rule. There were a few other kind of interesting asshole books, but nothing quite captured the problem in its sort of totality and its full generality uh, than Aaron's book. And I was familiar with Aaron already, thanks to his global justice uh, writing before that, because that's another realm in which I've done a lot of work in writing. So I reached out to him and we just ended up sort of collaborating um, on lots of things, but it occurred to us that money would be a good place to start <clears throat> because a better way of maybe understanding the nature of a republic and the nature, therefore, of the polity that we all constitute, a really interesting angle on understanding what a polity is and what a polity's potential is, is precisely by approaching it from the point of view of that which it, which it issues in the form of a money. So in a sense, it was meant to be a kind of a political theoretic and political practical project right from the get-go. Hmm. Pretty amazing. I, I can add, so Bob put up, had this event at Cornell, and then and it also occurred to me at the same time that John Walker was working on the documentary uh, that's based on the book, Assholes. It's also called Assholes. And then Bob was an ideal person to sort of bring in to, to do Wall Street assholes and stuff like that. <laughs> so during, during that time, and then we also went to New York City and, and did uh, filming too. And then during that time, Bob and I were constantly like talking, you know, about finance and law and, regu you know, an asshole, the asshole management problem and asshole capitalism and all these different topics and sort of realizing we're like totally on the same page about all kinds of things and a, a kind of amusing a little bit amusing john walker you know while he's producing all these shots was having trouble getting us to not can, can you guys stop talking you know like, <laughs> like it was like, just stay on the like well i need you just to say this thing you know like uh, uh but uh so anyway that that seemed like such a great confluence of like ideas and collaboration that we sort of thought oh well we should put all that together in a book where you can kind of put it all all in there whereas in academic stuff you know kind of it's more confined by methodologies. Um, in this case, the book was supposed to lay out, um, yeah, a bunch of ideas that you can't really put all together anywhere else. But it's, it is, in a way, a response to the asshole problem because we think of the asshole political problem as a response to underlying economic and social problems. And then a really neglected part of the solution to those problems is are things that we can do with money, things we can do with the central bank, things with ways that financial markets, ways banks need to be reined in, that if we get those things right, then we'll have a much better sort of social contract, a much better set of economic conditions, and we're less likely to sort of become assholes, sort of fighting over scraps and you know and and status comparisons and things like that, you know, like in a in a more prosperous, promising uh, kind of economy. There you go. And for my audience, the book and documentary film we're referring to is entitled "Assholes." a theory so you can go and google that as well so uh lay a foundation for us if you would as to what the uh i guess maybe thesis of the book would be in short form as to as to what the thrust of of you guys are are, are talking about here sure i mean maybe one approach would be to say that you know I, as, as, as i noted before we think of a money as something that a polity issues right something that a polity produces or puts out there um and insofar as a money is that uh, it it makes for a nice or interesting angle from which to approach the nature of a polity or a republic. But um, one way to lay the foundation then is to sort of say a little bit more about what that means to say that the money is the is the public or the republic's issuance. So our particular take on it is it's essentially a way in which the members of a republic spot credit to one another, right? So one way to think about this is, you know, anytime you're going to produce something, right? If we're producing material abundance over time, right? If a civilization is, is, is producing material abundance and material wealth over time, by far the greater part of that activity is done on a kind of credit, right? You basically borrow um, the resources that you need to put to work to produce more resources, right? To sort of grow in wealth. And unless everybody's already born with plenty of material resources out of which to construct or build things, um, you're not really going to have any way of getting any productive activity of that kind going on, right? Unless you have some way by which people can kind of spot one another credit or give one another temporary access to resources they don't already have in order to put them to work to 
produce yet more resources. Uh, and it turns out for a variety of reasons that we might get into over the course of our chat today, um, that the most efficient and straightforward and functional way to do this is for the members, for the Republic itself as a whole, to issue, in effect, that credit, those sorts of claims on resources, and to sort of manage that sort of issuance, right, that kind of allocation uh, of productive credit. Um, and in a way, that's sort of what the book is about, right? That's why we start with the idea that money is a promise, right? Credit, the word credit, of course, comes from the Latin credere, which is the same credere you find in words like credo, right? Basically believing, finding credible. Uh, and if you think about it, a, a money is a kind of credible public promise, a kind of commitment that we make to one another. Uh, that's very abstract sounding. Uh, as we sort of elaborate, of course, we'll get more concrete, but that would be a sort of a first pass, maybe at sort of laying a foundation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the big picture. You can get to that it just from the simple philosophical question, what is money? Um, which very few people know how to answer. What it, What is money exactly? Like, what's the thing that you're spending your life chasing, organizing your life, your whole life and work, and you're, you're taking this job to get more money. You're worried about, you know, school or career or, or relationships because to get money. What is that thing? Uh, you know, people think, well, does it, does it have something to do with gold and silver? No. Did it used to not kind of only indirectly, not really. It hasn't for a long time, a hundred years. So what is money? What is this mysterious things that we're all organizing our lives around? And then here's a simple way to start getting an answer. Well, look, look on money, the U S say U S dollar dollar bill and, and see what it, see what it tells you about what money is assuming there's maybe something to learn there. And as Bob and I know in the book and both of us like to point out, note in classes, Along the, along the top of the bill, it says Federal Reserve Note is what it reads across all of the you know, different denominations of dollar bills. And that note, which people, that word note is a legal term, it's legalese for promissory note. So the dollar bill itself is telling you that it is a note that stands for a promise on, well, whose promise to whom? Well, it's the government's promise, and in particular, the Federal Reserve's promise. What's the Federal Reserve? What's the Federal Reserve? Well, it's a central bank. It's a public bank established in 1913, so a little over 100 years ago. It was the first time there was really, so, so basically the money, the dollar came to be issued by a public bank in a way that it never had been before in 1913. And so the dollar, a dollar is a, is a public promise from our public bank to to whoever holds the the dollar in your hand, hold over you the hand. So it's a dollar. It's a it's a debt of the government and a cre and a, a a credit in your hands, an asset in your hands when you have it. What's the promise to? Well, in in part, it's just the government will accept it back in settling debts to it, say taxes, fees, and fines. So it'll take that in, in payment, right? It's a promise to accept it in payment, and that's pretty important. Since you know, if you want to get out of jail or <laughs> pay or pay your taxes, or, <laughs> you need those dollars. Yeah. <laughs> you need dollars. I see where those dollars were created like, for taxes. Only, yeah. only dollars. Yeah. Um, and then, since that's important to note to all of us, we use those we use those credits with with each other. You know, in 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 paying each other uh, money, um, in in working for we do work for other people in dollars and employment relationships buy and sell things in these dollar credits. So these are, these are basically uh, promissory credits on the, when we have them debts of the government, promissory debts of the government, they were circular around. That's the basis for all of the commerce, all investment, the whole global economy as well, since the dollar has a special role there. So like that, that vertical dimension <clears throat> makes possible a horizontal dimension, right? It begins as a kind of creditor debtor, relation between each member of the republic each citizen on the one hand and the republic as a whole sort of at the top on the other hand so there's like a vertical relation between us and each of us and our own polity but once you have right a credit instrument like a public promissory note called the federal reserve note that functions in that kind of vertical way since everybody has to have it for that vertical relation since all of us relate in that vertical way to the polity as a whole, we now also have a kind of foundation for then horizontal relations, horizontal monetary or payment relations. And so we all use that same instrument in that way. And what's sort of intriguing historically is every money historically seems to have operated that way. Every money seems to have started 
as a vertical relation between individual members of some kind of political organization or religious organization on the one hand, which then quickly comes to be used horizontally precisely because it's universal in as much as literally everybody has at least that vertical relation to that political authority or that religious authority. So every, <clears throat> every money seems to have started that way, including the so-called precious metal monies. People think that basically that gold became a money because it was precious, but it's really more accurate to say that gold became precious because it became a money. And the reason it became a money was because that material gold itself is sufficiently malleable as to have a sovereign's image stamped into it and is also corrosion resistant, right? It won't rust in the way that iron will. Same story with silver. So all of those so-called precious metals seem to have become precious in part, not simply because they were shiny or attractive as jewelry, but because they were ideal physical media into which to stamp monetary uh, symbols, as it were. Um, but anyway, so every every money seems to have a history very much that sort of replicates this kind of functional vertical to horizontal story that Aaron and I tell in the book. And so in the book, you guys are defining, you know, what money is and relationship with it and everything else. And then you guys have some uh, uh, theories or, or, or presentations on a better way to maybe do things that don't involve maybe money or ledgers or other things of that nature. Is that correct? Yeah. You want to start with that, Aaron? Yeah. Well, so one thing you think of, if you think about what money is, it's a kind of promise, it's a kind of public promise. And then you can re you realize that it's, it's maybe not as scarce as you might otherwise think. If you think of money as like a scarce gold or metal, you know, scale silver, there's only so much of it in the ground. In order to get more money, we have to dig up more of that or wait for gold miners to go dig up this stuff. Like that, that picture of, of money is it's inherently scarce. There's only so much of it. If, if government wants to do something, you know, it's got to get money from somewhere, like from somebody who already has it, right? It's got to, it's got to tax people who already have money, or it's got to borrow it from them. You know, somehow, like those are basically the ways you can get money, or you know, other than like just digging gold up and then fashioning it into you know gold notes that stand for money. So that picture is totally wrong if what we're saying is right. Money is just a promise, and in that case, like m money isn't in, in inherently scarce in the way that you know yellow rocks are. Um, pro because promises aren't inherently scarce. I mean, so uh, our, my capacity to promise, I mean, how do I, how do I create a promise? Well, I can create it from nothing. If I'm the, if I, I'm authorized to make promises about my own whereabouts, say, then I can say, Hey, I'll meet you, you know, at 11 uh, mountain time. Um, and then what happened? Well, from nothing, I created an obligation for me to meet you at 11 and you, a claim, you gave you a claim against me. So a real, there's a real change in our relationship a real promissory debt, a real promissory claim on your part. And that comes from nothing just because on my say so, just because I decide to, I can exercise that authority. And that, and gives, now, you, oh, yeah, sorry, well, that gives you the basis to understand what the real constraint is, right? I mean, yeah. the constraint isn't how much, how many gold rocks there, there, there are or how much material substance of one kind or another there is. The real limit is your capacity to fulfill your own promises, right? So Aaron and I are very fond of pointing out that you can create promises literally ad infinitum, right, from nothing, hence the title of the book, Money From Nothing. There's a limit you can overcommit, right? If, if we tell you we're going to meet with you at 11 o'clock mountain time, but we've also each told a couple of dates, we're going to meet them for coffee at 11 o'clock mountain time. We can't do all of that at the same time unless we can buy locate. And in that sense, we can overcommit. And if we make a habit of doing that, people begin to discount our promises. And you can think of that as a form of inflation, right? It's the kind of the, the basis of inflation with, with money, right? Similarly, though, uh, just as in monetary relations, there's deflation, not just inflation, there's the possibility of a kind of promissory deflation as well. And that would be if each of us, let's say Aaron and I fear commitment, or we're afraid we're not going to be able to live up to our obligations. And so we always, like Chris contact, Chris Voss contact, contacts us and says, hey, you guys want to talk at 11? And Aaron and I both say, uh, we kind of fear commitment. I don't want to, look, I don't want to commit. You know, I might not be able to. If you made a habit of that, if that was your, your way of, of life, you would basically be impoverishing yourself, right? Because we'd be denying ourselves the opportunity of personal enrichment and intellectual growth through conversation with you, Chris, uh, and with all the other things that we do. And so if you think about it, there's a kind of wonderful Aristotelian golden mean that most people strive for when it comes to making commitments to others, right? We don't overcommit, but we also don't undercommit. We just try to do it just right in that Goldilocks way. And if you think about it, money management by a polity, or in other words, the central bank's job is just that, to find that Aristotelian golden mean 
between overcommitting, i.e. inflating too much, putting out too much money on the one hand, and putting out too little money on the other, which is just basically economic uh, doldrums, right? That's what a slowdown is. It's there's just not enough money, not enough promising. Right. And, and here we can add that in the for the past 10 years in the United States, we've been in basically a deflationary environment. That is, there hasn't been enough money out chasing goods. And and so we're, we're sort of suffering. We're not getting as rich as we could be getting, we're not doing as well as we could be doing because there's not enough money, um, you know, out there. And so, well, how, how do we solve that problem? Well, just create more money. Like <laughs> you just make more promises. If your life is impoverished because you haven't made enough commitments, you just commit to more things. You find out some worthy things, find the, which are the most important things that are worth doing. And you just decide to do those things. That's something the central bank does whenever the government just decides to spend money. It just creates those dollars from nothing and puts them into, injects them into the banking system or it authorizes it's, or it's authorizing private banks or nominally private banks that are chartered and authorized to issue dollars in the form of loans that creates money too. So you just, you just decide to do that and make sure that the, the promises go to the right places. They go to sort of the more productive um, activities, um, you know, and then that, <laughs> That as a result is how you make, how, that's how you address the problem of there being too little money. You just make more promises the way you can uh, from nothing. And now there could be, as Bob's saying, there is a potential problem of having too much money, chasing too few goods, inflation in the economy, but we're really far away from that, that problem right now. And um, we don't have to worry about it. A typical thing you hear in financial discussions as soon as, and actually just recently, The Economist just put out an article about inflation, you know, is inflation around the corner? The standard thing to do is, you know, as soon as the government starts spending a little bit more money, like it has during the during the pandemic, you know, is to start worrying about hyperinflation and, you know, like, and, and say Venezuela, Greece, that, you know, <laughs> you know like, mongering, <laughs> like Dr. Strangelove, that's why we like, pat, pat, pat in the title and, and uh, ongoing joke in the book about Dr. Strangelove. Um, it's about that kind of um, fear mongering and sort of par the paranoid style of American politics, really, um, as mm -hmm. Hofstetter. But, but, but there, in the book, we lay out a bunch of reasons why um, the things both the Fed can already do and with new tools it can get it, we can guarantee that there's not going to be a problem of hyperinflation. Yeah, we so can manage that. We can right. manage it, right? We can make sure we can make sure that we we can get a lot more money in the economy just by letting government just spending a lot more money into existence in the right places in the right places and then we can be sure we can be certain that it's not going to be there's not going to be too much money we can hit the goldilocks locks balance um and the other thing to manage all that yeah and the other thing maybe worth quickly appending in this connection chris is that if you're doing aaron and i both keep saying you know directing it to the right places spending it in the right ways in the right places one way of understanding or sort of defining what should count as the right places is by understanding one of the critical, one of the most important means of preventing inflation. And that is by spending the money in places or in ways that produce more goods and services to, uh, to essentially absorb the new money itself, right? People tend to think oftentimes of inflation or even deflation, if they think about deflation at all, as something that's just kind of absolute, right? You have this much money, now it's inflationary. If you have that much money, it's not inflationary. But that's a mistake. Inflation, the best, I think, meme for people maybe to remember to get this right is to remember that inflation is a relation, right? It should be a bumper sticker. Inflation is a relation. Mm -hmm. It's a relation between, you know, very roughly speaking, the money supply on the one hand and the goods and services supply on the other. And that's why we have those colloquial expressions, too much money chasing too few goods or too little money chasing too many goods. What you want is to maintain a kind of parity, right? So if you're basically issuing new money, if what that money is doing is financing new productive activity, which is in turn producing more goods and services, then you got this rising in tandem with this. And as long as they're you know, roughly proportional in that way, you don't have an inflation problem at all. The inflation problem only happens when one of these goes up and the others does the other doesn't, or if one goes down and the other doesn't, right? That's deflation, that's inflation. But as long as you're doing this, you don't have an inflation or deflation problem. So, you know, if you're spending, if the government is, let's say that the public is issuing a lot more credit money in order for people to gamble on Wall Street, right? To buy a fixed number of financial instruments that are already out there, 
that's just going to drive up the prices of those instruments. And that's essentially a hyperinflation in the financial markets. We have a more common word for that. We call it a bubble, right? A financial bubble. But all of, yeah, but all a bubble is, is a hyperinflation in a particular market. But if instead of directing the money toward the financial markets, it's being directed to the productive sectors, mm-hmm. then you're actually producing more stuff that will absorb that new money. And so you can go way, 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 way out there before you have any sort of inflation problem at all. Uh, it's really unfortunate to me that a lot of people don't learn about what the Federal Reserve is. I was fortunate enough that early on I, I went uh, to be a stockbroker and had to learn, you know, how that worked. And and then I owned a mortgage company for almost twenty years. So Alan Greenspan was either my friend or my foe. Um, and and so a lot of people don't understand, you know, M one M two money policy. They don't understand how the Federal Reserve even works. Um, you know, we've seen them pour trillions into liquidating the uh, market or keeping it stable on on the stock market. And there's been times in the U.S. history where we've accumulated a lot of debt, like World War II, and we've been able to just absorb it back into the system without it uh, causing too much trouble for us. I think I think some of what your guys' uh, discussion in the book too is how we can change it to where maybe I don't know if you guys talk about uh, like uh, maybe a flat income or some sort of income that supports people. I was just watching someone in Canada who was making a joke about how our government wants to give us six hundred bucks on top of the original twelve hundred, and they're like, "We've been getting two thousand dollars a month from the the state of Canada uh, if you don't have money." Same thing with my friends in Australia, and. Um, so tell us a little bit about that, if I'm correct in that. Yeah, I can do that. Uh, yeah, so one of our one of our big ideas, um, aside from just spending a lot of new money in productive ways, like for for green energy investment or for new jobs and stuff like that, that's a, that's a big part of it. But another sort of maybe a little farther out thing, but just as obviously important, is just for us for the central bank to just give us all. Uh, money, <laughs> right? And the, the the easiest way to do that is for it to, for uh, us to have accounts with the central bank in just the way the big banks now have accounts with the central bank. So right now they have accounts with the central bank, we have accounts with, with the big private banks, right? But so you just cut out the middleman and we all have accounts at the Fed, citizen accounts as we call them. And then at that point, the, the Fed can just give us money just by typing in $2,000 a month or just automating the keystrokes. Right? So $2,000 a month appears in our account um, every month. And then you can have some, you know, it'll just show up online. You'll see that in your account. And then you can have a, a, a digital wallet to spend it in various places and things like that. Um, and then uh, crucially, um, the Fed can do the same thing it does with the big banks now to manage um, inflation or interest rates by just by attaching interest rates on those accounts. So it can, uh, it can just the way our private bank accounts all already have interest rates attached to. So it can raise or lower those interest rates when it wants us to save or spend. So if it wants us to save more money, it raises the interest rate. So there's more of an incentive to keep the money in the account. Um, if it wants us to low, uh, to spend money, to it, it'll ha- it just lowers the interest rate. And there's lots of other things it can do with these, these accounts to, to basically run monetary policy via more democratically via all of our accounts. So that's, that's like a, a much more efficient m- mechanism than what it does now. So it's more efficient economically for its monetary policy purposes, but it's also better for everybody because we all get uh, free money, right? Um, and, and, and sure money. Um, it's not just that it's free, it's sure. It's, so it's stable, you know, mm-hmm. basic income grant available to everybody, all citizens or anyone, you know, who you let in. To and let note, in. note how you'd, you'd be taking care of the unbanked and underbanked problem at the same time, right? It'd be very easy. So here's um, here's another thing we sort of point out in this connection, right? A lot of, most Americans don't know this, um, but anybody who wants to, who already has a bank account at least, right now could open an account with the U.S. Treasury Department. It's called Treasury Direct, and you can buy U.S. Treasury securities uh, through that account, and you can redeem U.S. Treasury securities through that account. So you can basically buy and sell vis-a-vis our own Treasury right now. Anybody who wants to do it, just just Google Treasury Direct. You'll immediately get that site, and you can open your account in less than 10 minutes. Now, here's the kind of cool thing. Um, if you talk to people at U.S. Digital Service, which is essentially a federal agency, an executive agency, that works to sort of update the technology uh, across the government, right, across all departments of the government. Um, I've talked to U.S. Digital Service. They say that within a month or so, they could upgrade all of those Treasury Direct accounts into digital wallets. They could convert them, in other words, into horizontally accessible or transactional P2P wallets, rather than there just being 
currently vertical accounts, right? So in effect, we could give everybody in the country a digital wallet through Treasury within a month, right? Like basically before before Valentine's Day, if we were to decide to do it right now. And then those Treasury Direct account or Treasury Direct wallets could be migrated over to the Federal Reserve. It always takes the Fed a little bit longer to kind of gear up to do something new than the Treasury. For some reason, Treasury is more nimble. But in any event, you could migrate all of that over to the Fed once it's ready. And then these wallets would be effectively what Aaron was just describing. Everybody in the country would have a digital wallet, which would basically be the functional equivalent of a bank account, but you could use your phone or any other device to manage it. And we could make payments to one another horizontally over the, or through those wallets in the same way that we could pay our taxes or receive federal benefits through those wallets. And as Aaron was just suggesting it, also that would make monetary policy work much more efficiently too, because we cut out the middlemen, right? The way it works now is if we as a polity um, through our Fed want the three of us, for example, to spend more money, we basically make money cheaper to the banks. And then the hope is that the banks will then lend to us more cheaply. But that, of course, doesn't work if we don't want to borrow. And it also, even when it does work, it's just, there's an extra step interpolated. So it's not efficient. But if instead the Fed just said, hey, let's just put more money in people's wallets to get them to spend more, like because the CARES Act finally passes or the HEROES Act finally passes, or if it says, let's lower the interest uh, payments on those wallets, or let's raise the interest payments on those wallets, depending on whether we want people to spend more or save more, it's all much more direct and immediate. Uh, and so we think it would make for better monetary policy too, in addition to taking care of the problem of commercial and financial disenfranchisement that the problem of the unbanked basically is. And so it might get us through a bottom that we're going to go through or we're starting to really go through with this with this thing or the crisis and stuff like that. Is this some of the steps that Biden should maybe take in the new administration? Absolutely. Yeah, he should. Yeah. yeah. I mean, one, there's people that are still waiting around for their or the first round of checks <laughs> that was set up. They're still waiting ahead yeah. about it because it's like <clears throat> it's a creaky, inefficient system, you know, and then other, other people had to wait for a long time. It was only certain people, you know, had certain connections you know, through already getting their like Social Security deposit checks deposit so in a fairly creaky system it's very hard to get people money quickly when you need it quickly for relief or, or just to stimulate um uh, the economy and so like that's this is all stuff we should have been starting to do to streamline that process um like for just to just ease the pain of the of the pandemic and and we should we should it's you know best <clears throat> time to plant a tree is 20 years ago the next best time is now so we should we should start now doing this this stuff too um and then, you know, and, and but a, a big idea for the book in our book is that that these kinds of, you know, basically a free money through using central banking um, and us banking with the central bank isn't just an emergency measure. It's a long term solution. So and we can sustain it for the long term. It's not just, OK, like in war, you know, war, the World War Two was paid for because a lot of money was created and then it was pulled out of the economy with war bonds. That's that's how it was paid for. It wasn't through taxes. Right. But so, and, and people agree, understand that to, to some extent, and they say, okay, during wars and emergencies, you can do that. Okay, pandemics, maybe that's an emergency. We can do that. We can create a lot of new money. But then later, we got to go back to, uh, you know, a balanced budget or something like that. Um, um, and we got to go back to the old ways. And now there's, there's conflicting tensions in that within, even among, <laughs> say, centrist type people or Democrats, like, and there's a certain number of people that are going to quickly say, no, inflation is a problem or balance, but debt's a problem. And, and what we're saying still is um, we like all the, we like, we, we need more emergency measures, but what the kinds of emergencies we measures that were, that we recommend can work for the long run too. They're sustainable over the long haul. Um, the Fed can use existing tools and new tools to manage inflation for the long run. And as long as we're directing, you know, spending in the right ways, partly through central bank policy, partly through good, good spending on like climate change ad adaptation and new jobs, green jobs and clean jobs, clean industry, things like that. Then that's something we can make work for the long haul. Or if you will, it, it, it'll, it's, it's not just, we can respond not just to the, to the, um, pan, the COVID emergency, we can respond to the climate change emergency and also the democracy emergency <laughs> because, you know, democracy is like not do it, doing so well and it's kind of falling apart and we, We've maybe narrowly averted its demise, but and we've got another chance. But we can't assume that, you know, um, even, even if Biden won and there's a chance for, you know, to to repair the republic, we've got to take that chance and pull out all the stops and really go for it in a big way. So, um, 
It's like a variation on the <clears throat> on the idea of not wasting a crisis, right? I mean, there's a there's a kind of a cynical take that one could take on that, but there's also a noble take that one could take on that, right? The cynical take is oh, one's being opportunistic. That's what disaster capitalism is all about. You know, you can take advantage of a crisis to sort of cut social programs or eliminate things. That's the shock doctrine idea, of course, that Naomi Klein is is, is associated with, which is very insightful. But the kind of the noble counterpart to that is to say, look, there's some big problems that need to be solved, but it's kind of hard to get the public's attention focused on them at, you know, at, at, in, in ordinary times, let's say. And, you know, the ship of state, so to speak, when the state itself has a population of 300 plus million and occupies the entirety of a continent, it's kind of hard to get the whole thing to sort of change course just sort of on a whim. You need something to kind of galvanize attention, to make people kind of get serious and to make people focus for a little bit longer than they do on a TikTok video because it's a sort of a longer term sort of thing. And a crisis can be a, the perfect opportunity to do that because now people are on it, so to speak, at least for the time being. And so a lot of the things that Aaron and I are, are pushing, we both have argued for a long time should be being done. Uh, and we argue now should have been done 20 years ago, so to speak, like when it was the right time to plant the tree. But now that we do have, you know, now, that, now that we have your attention, now that, um, you know, the sort of the public's attention is drawn to what uh, Senator Warren often refers to as deep structural reform, this is the time to do it, right? And indeed, the, the just to go back to the digital wallet idea that Aaron and I have in the book, you know, you might remember back in March when the talk was, when the, you know, basically when the CARES Act was passed and they were saying, well, how do we get these relief checks to people? Well, part of the problem was that, you know, some people they couldn't track down, but other people just didn't even have bank accounts or whatever, right? So you have to find their addresses, then you send them paper checks. You have to wait for six months until Donald Trump can get around to signing them because he wants to make sure his name is on everything in the same way that the dog has to lift its leg at every fire hydrant. And so everything, you know, just kind of sitting around waiting. But, you know, Aaron and I were saying back then, you know, actually, if we had had this digital wallet structure in place, this would be a, a non-problem, right? You just immediately credit everybody's wallets. But then when you find out that US Digital Service could convert Treasury Direct accounts within a month into those, and you think, well, why isn't this done before June, right? What, why didn't we do this before summer even, right? And to, to add one last point here, which is kind of fun and cool, um, we all know a lot of things about our new vice president-elect, but one thing that people don't tend to know because it's kind of obscure and nerdy sounding, but she's like this total fangirl, or fanboy, fangirl of U.S. Digital Service, right? This entity I mentioned before, which was uh, something that Obama put into the executive department. It was a, an Obama era innovation. And she just thinks that's like the coolest executive agency around. And yet almost nobody's heard of it. But the, the stuff that it could do, the stuff that U.S. Digital Service, now that we have a, a vice president coming in who actually cares about it and loves it, I mean, the sky is kind of the limit this coming spring, it seems to us. Yeah, there, there needs to be, you know, I watched the fallout from the 2008-2009 uh, the crisis um, and, and, you know, the bailout and all that stuff. It seems to be like the Federal Reserve really is there to bulk up the rich people in this country. Moving to a system like yours... Um, you know, a lot of my millionaire friends, they, that's what they talk about. They go, I need to preserve wealth because at this point it's just taxes just eating me alive. Um, does this devalue their wealth and are they going to be in for it? I can address it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, so, um, that we agree that the bailouts then were inequitable and that, you know, wall street wasn't really addressed like, and that's, and, and to some extent, a lot of these ideas are would address some of those problems. Now there's some, to some degree, the sort of bailout type stuff that the Fed been doing has been inequitable too. Even if we agree it was the right thing to do in principle, the way it was managed, you know, it didn't, not enough of the benefits flowed to sort of ordinary people, working people, you know, um, people with rent or mortgages to pay, or even small businesses, you know, like they didn't really benefit. Now the, the, the potential means were there, like the facilities to help cities and states get really cheap money, but that was sort of hobbled to some degree by penalty rates imposed by the treasury, things like that. So that it's kind of a more mixed, still a mixed case. But so if we think through, well, let's think about how to make our money, the dollar and our public bank work for all of us in, it, in a way that's more, but not only more efficient, but also more equitable. Um, then that sounds, that sounds like a great thing. And we're kind of inching our way there, you know, uh, like the, the, the problems aren't, aren't as bad this, this time for bailouts as they were for last time. 
Um, and then, and, and new technologies are only making it more obvious that like of how we can do it. So for example, you know, with like digital le ledger technology, you know, which has become sort of pretty important, you know, a lot of central banks, like 80% of them around the world, apparently are, are looking into some version of it. A lot of them are, you know, already starting to, you know, already starting some measure of it. And maybe it's inevitable. And once you start thinking about that, um, you know, then a lot of the sort of stuff we can say, we're, we're saying we should do becomes really natural or even even easier to do. So it's even easier to do efficiency and equity without uh, without the big problems of the bailouts. Once you're sort of relying less on the on the the sort of hierarchy of, in the, that's we have within the system as we have it. And another thing maybe worth noting here, Chris, for on, on you know for the for the benefit of of your wealthier or all of our wealthier friends is that. What we're advocating in a lot of ways goes a lot easier on wealthy folk than various other proposals that have been out there, right? So if you take the state of New York, for example, as a contrasting case, right? New York, of course, does not have the capacity to issue its own currency. It can't kind of generate money. There is no central bank of New York that has that capacity. If there were, it would be engaged in counterfeiting. Um, and what that means is that New York actually does face a budget constraint, right? Whereas the nation as a whole only faces what we think of as a resource or production constraint, not, not a money or financial constraint. But a state uh, does face a budget constraint or financial constraint. And for that very reason, um, the new supermajority uh, Democratic caucus within the New York legislature is talking about passing emergency tax the rich legislation um, before Christmas, right? Because the state budget's in serious trouble because of all of the pandemic abatement costs and pandemic response costs. And so it's looking as though there might be a significant new tax hike on millionaires and billionaires in, in New York. I myself am not opposed to that, but I'm only bringing this up now as a sort of contrast. That's what you kind of got to do if you're a state. But if you're the United States and you're doing the kinds of things that Aaron and I uh, are talking about, then you can do this without raising taxes, right? Because in effect, what we're talking about here is adopting measures that are stimulative without being inflationary. You simply issue more money, but you do it in a way that's directing it towards sectors of the economy that will then boost production and hence money absorptive capacity. And thus you can get lots more public spending going on in a non-inflationary way that then doesn't require you to tax a bunch of people for a sort of counter-inflationary offset, which is the principal function, of course, that federal taxes play, or at least one of the two principal functions. The other has to do with social policy. If you want to discourage drinking, then you tax liquor or whatever. But, but the main function of taxes, apart from you know, sort of affecting social policy by changing the costs and benefits of doing things is essentially kind of suck some of the money out of the economy if too much has been put in and it's generating inflationary pressure. So if you do things of the kind that Aaron and I are pushing for the federal government to do, that really actually puts, you know, puts off or it sort of postpones indefinitely the time at which you would have to raise federal taxes, right? And so in that sense, we think millionaires or billionaires should be kind of happy with what we're pushing. And again, as long as it doesn't get inflationary such that their savings are effectively wiped out, they're actually sitting pretty. They're doing fine. So with what happens to the banks? Uh, I mean, the, not the Federal Reserve banks, but the underlying banks that, that, you know, they make a profit on the market. Well, in the in the book, we say something sort of like we think we should cut out the middleman and rely less on the bank. So that doesn't mean so just do a lot more with public banking. Uh, via the central bank. And now that means that including taking over the payment system for the most part. Now, now private banks can still piggyback on um, on that. And, and we would all have sort of effect credit lines of $2,000 a month or whatever in the form of a basic income payment. And now that's, now we, if you need credit beyond that, you need money, credit money beyond that, you could get, go to a private bank to get that for a car or for a house or whatever. So that they could still have a role there. And in fact, that might improve the business of banking because people have sure money and they're, they're, they're better, Better lending bets, you know, there's less risk of default if you can count on that, that sure money. You know, employment is less of a shock, you know, things like that. Um, and so there's a there's a potential role for them, but um, you you can still argue that there's the, mm -hmm. that they're less and le a lot less necessary. And um, they're also maybe valuable as a hedge if people are worried about there's two worries about privacy. One is, you know, private banks profiteering with your data. And then the, our idea is, well, if you have a public option, public option, well, you've got a, ch a check on that so you can keep money over on the public bank. But if people are worrying about prying eyes of government officials, you know, then you might think you want a private alternative. So there's kind of like a, the, the kind of two uh, public-private option system seems like it might help create accountability between both. 
So those are some of the functions, but it, it does mean that we can just rely a lot less on the private banking system and hold them a much, make them much more accountable and, and much less opportunistic, you know, and, and much more, much less likely to be, you know, purely speculative um, in a way that's like been destructive for the economy. Yeah. Another thing maybe worth noting in this connection, Chris, two other things. One benefit that the private sector banking industry could enjoy is that, you know, we, we know from lots of empirical uh, research that people who have previously been sort of commercially disenfranchised, that's to say sort of not involved in the private banking system, when they are given uh, bank accounts through some charitable organization or some kind of program, like a pilot program in some city, and they get into the habit then of maintaining an account of some sort where they save money in it and they spend money out of it and so forth, they often transition in time once they have built up enough wealth into using private sector banks that they wouldn't have used previously because they just hadn't saved enough money to do it or they just had never been introduced into that sector. So if you had the public option of the kind that we're talking about, but let's say this was an option that was only available for amounts up to $5,000 or 10,000 or whatever, some people who benefit by using that public option, once they kind of get into the flow of things, might want additional bank accounts. Lots of people, of course, who do have bank accounts have more than one with different banks. And so you can imagine there being some spillover into the private sector banking business, but basically new clientele that the public option has, in effect, brought into the practice of banking type behavior in the first place. Uh, and then the second thing I was going to note is that another way to sort of think about at least the banks that do what we want them to do, that's to say, actually make loans in order to sort of spark new enterprises, new businesses, more production one problem with the system that we have now is that the, the lending criteria that banks adopt are themselves a function of regulations that we place on the banks, right? And the current regulatory imperative that we operate with now is that the loans that banks make have to be profitable. Now, in an earlier time before financialization, to be profitable and to be productive were sort of extensionally equivalent. It was almost the same thing, right? You probably, you basically couldn't be profitable unless you were productive. But with financialization and with all of these sort of primary, secondary, tertiary derivatives financial markets, there are lots of ways to be profitable now without being productive. And so another way to look at what Aaron and I are pushing is to say, well, what we might do is say, look, private sector banks are still going to be in the lending business. They're still going to be, in effect, lending Fed money to private sector ent ent enterprises. But we would slightly adjust or amend the criterion. Instead of saying that these have to be profitable loans, we would say they have to be productive loans, since lots of profitable loans are not productive. And then we could say you could you still do what you've always done. You could be lending. And in effect, you'd be doing what you guys all used to do primarily before the 1980s, right? Before financialization really kicked in, to be a profitable lending bank was to be a productive lending bank. So we just say, we want you guys to basically play the kind of role or have the social function that you had before the 1980s. And nobody thought that bankers were starving or a disadvantaged group before the 1980s. It was considered to be a very lucrative profession. You know, the, you know it was the old bit, I can't, was it the, I think it was the rule of three or something. I can't remember what it was, but you, you, you work three days a week, you go home at three o'clock. Uh, you know, it, it was a pretty low key business to be involved in, and yet you still made good money at it. Um, and you know, I, I think going back even to something like that, um, you could imagine doing with what we're proposing. And it doesn't seem to be, if I were a banker, I wouldn't view that as uh, you know, some terrible onerous disadvantages being in pla uh, placed upon me. I just think, well, it's going back to a better time. Uh, what's your response to people that would say to that, uh, you know, giving people a minimum thing, that's communism. I mean, you're going to have those people, you know. Right. Well, I, I mean, I did a lot of misconceptions about, yeah, what's communism or socialism. I mean, for starters, uh, well, you might think about, well, the idea of giving people free money is Milton Friedman, you know, sort of arch <laughs> laissez-faire capitalist. You might Great think of him communist, as a, Milton Friedman, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, communist Milton Friedman. He, he was a favor of a negative. That became what we, in fact, have as a negative income tax in the form of the earned income tax credit. That was, you know, uh, that made it into law basically because of his influence. But we're, 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 what we're doing is sort of saying, yeah, let's do that, but let's, let's make it, um, let's just be more explicit about what we're already doing, which is a public bank giving people public money. Like, um, so is it public money? Well, here's socialism. Like, 
1913, over 100 years ago, <laughs> the dollar was socialized, meaning a public bank was created and publicly issued. And now that became the backbone of American capitalism, that public money, the dollar, the US dollar. It is a publicly issued instrumentality. It's our money. Margaret Thatcher was just talking confusion when she said there is no public money, there's only taxpayer money. The taxpayers have their money, but they all have dollars and the dollar is ours. It's, our, it's our, That's the Republican idea. It's Maggie like, apparently never thing. did a pound note, right? Maggie yeah, her and, never her and Ronald were pound. sleeping together, clearly. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, if, she, if, if Margaret Thatcher looked at the pound note, she'd see the picture of the queen on the note. And it's like, oh, it was, you know, that was already, it wasn't her, you know, it's not any particular person's, you know, uh, any, um, but anyway, so like, uh, the, the dollar was already socialized in 1913. Now, is that was that a, like a death blow to American capitalism? No, it was the basis of it. It's not anymore a threat to American, you know, uh, um, as like public beaches, public libraries, you know, which got established in big, big time back public parks, all of our national parks, you know, public mail services, you know, like this is all that's socialistic. That is, we have a market state balance. We have a mixed economy. That's what that's what made America great during the post-war decades. Um, and all we're doing is saying, look, it's, we're, we already have these public instrumentalities. We're using, we're developing them a little bit further. In fact, not that much further from the, the mechanisms that we already have mm -hmm. um, to basically do, you know, to basically give everybody, make sure everybody has money purchasing powers to make good on America's basic social con compact. The ones that, the one that it hasn't been making good on, you know, during the, after the Reagan and Th uh, Thatcher era. Another thing maybe worth noting here, Chris, is that um, if you divide roughly between the money part of the economy, let's say the money layer of the economy on the one hand, and then the sort of real productive layer on the other, you can say, look, um, you can imagine uh, four possibilities, right? You could have socialized production and socialized money. You could have totally private production and privately issued money. Or you could have privately issued money and publicly done production, or you could have publicly issued money and privately done production. And what seems to be the most stable combination through history is the case where you have essentially a kind of socialized money, right? So the money part of the economy is indeed handled publicly. And that ends up being, interestingly enough, a kind of prerequisite to the stable functioning of a privatized or privately managed productive sector of the economy, right? So in other words, in our past history, like if you go back to the 19th century before the 1860s, when the, the first federal dollar was issued, the so-called greenback that the treasury issued starting during the Civil War, before that period, <clears throat> we were having boom and bust cycles of basically seven years. Now it's like 20 or 30 years, but there was a crash like every seven years. And it was a really fits and starts sort of economy and kind of a slow development before the Civil War. The big industrial explosion in this country happened after the Civil War. And that was partly technological, uh, technologically based, but it was also partly because we now had a national money system for the first time after three enactments in the 1860s, the Currency Act, the National Banking Act, and the Legal Tender Act. And that's what gave us the proto-Fed, and the Fed just sort of finished the job 50 years later. But anyway, going back to those that early part of the 19th century, all that constant crashing was happening because you not only had privately ordered production, but you also had privately issued money, right? There were as many current paper currencies at that time as are our cryptocurrencies now, right? It was a total Tower of Babel of money. And so, you know, Pecos Bill Bank issues its own money. Rattlesnake Bank offers its own money. Daniel Webster Bank issues its own money. And these were all differently valued relative to one another. And if you went to buy something at a store or at the general store, you know, the guy running the store or the gal running the store had to pull out a big book the size of a telephone book and look at all of your different currencies in the book and find out what the discounted value of them was because they were all discounted relative to par. So a Pecos bill dollar might be worth 25 cents. A rattlesnake bank dollar might be worth 10 cents. And they'd have to count up all these discounted amounts and then figure out the total value that you'd laid out on the counter. That did not, let's, you know, let, needless to say, that did not facilitate rapid and efficient commercial transacting. And that meant it didn't facilitate rapid productive activity or productive development, right? So one way to look at the nationalization of the currency in the 1860s is as our countries finally have, and by the way, Abraham Lincoln, the first Republican president, was the, guy, was the brains behind this. He was the guy who really pushed it. It was the recognition that in order to have a privately ordered productive sector, 
you need to recognize that the monetary piece of that or the monetary overlay is an essentially a public good. It's like a public infrastructure. And so that has to be socialized. So you could say, arguably, I, I, I think both Aaron and I would argue that in order to have a capitalist economy in the productive sector, you have to have a socialized economy in the monetary sector. You need socialized money, in other words. And that's all the dollar bill is. Again, as Aaron pointed out, it's the queen who's on the pound note. It's George Washington who's on the dollar bill. He's not a private sector guy. He was the president, right? That's, the, that's why he's on there. He's not on there as a gentleman farmer from Virginia in the 1840s, I mean, the 1740s. He's on there as the first president of the U.S., which is, by the way, socialized governance, right? You could think of a, a, a nation state is just the socialization of governance. We don't all privately govern ourselves. We join together into a polity. And a polity, it's a race publica, right? That's what a republic is, a public thing. That public is the same as the soci or socio in socialism. It's That's what we do collectively in order to make it possible to do various things privately that we otherwise couldn't do because it would be total chaos, right? Mm -hmm. The uh, you guys bring some up some interesting points. In fact, I just realized what you're talking about with the the uh, earned income credit being a socialist mm -hmm. thing because um, you know it, it really rewards breeding. One of the things that I hate being a single guy is that I pay just shitloads of taxes, <laughs> and yet if you go out and just uh, uh, knock up as many bitches as you possibly can, you 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 know you don't pay any taxes. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. that was like a rap reference there or something. I don't know what that was. Um, you know, you guys, uh, the other thing, too, is Margaret Thatcher. Every time someone brings up Margaret Thatcher to me, I, I think of the Iron Lady reference and how she might have earned it. Clearly, she had a Steely Dan. Those of you who don't get that joke, you can go look at the fuck up. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, I don't know. Burrows, right? Don't know. <laughs> so uh, two last questions I have for you. One is, what happens to all the currency? Because there's like... China owns a shitload of treasuries. Uh, you know, a lot of countries around the world own a lot of treasuries in us. It's part of the global debt. What happens to all that shit with the ledger and does it destabilize the world? Mm -hmm. You want to take Chris Crack, Aaron? Oh, yeah, sure. I, I mean, I think, <laughs> yeah. yeah right. He throws that to you, Aaron. Yeah, well, like, go for that one, Aaron. Yeah. No, I just, the short answer is it, it, makes, it makes no difference. I mean, because those are already just uh, mm -hmm. ledger entries. Yeah, fuck those guys. Entries. And then, uh, um, I mean, in fact, what, what 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 we've done is is like the so we've spent money into the economy right and then the, the amount that you don't tax back that's that's a deficit but some of the money gets borrowed back temporarily which is to say the the got the u.s says you know issues a treasury so someone buys a treasury if you give us these dollars we'll give you a promise to return at a later time with a little extra right that's a treasury security right um and then so um um the this it's, it can be exactly the same. I mean, those are instead of having dollars, which are liquid uh, public uh, debts, treasuries are just le are less liquid, you know, public debts. So it's it's the same thing. But it's sort of which it's sort of which account do you want it? When you hold a treasury, you hold a dollar. It's just you're having one account rather than another at the at the central bank. Now, if you like, if the accounting is all the same, but if you change the platform for the accounting, make it a, on a you know a different technology. Then it's as long as the numbers are the same, then the the the, the debt obligations are the same. Yeah. Um, so it, it doesn't it doesn't change um, um, all this thing. I mean, once you're clear about this, you can think that we we don't have to rely as much as we do on treasuries. We don't need it to get money in order to pay for stuff to spend money. You see that from the what we're talking about. Um, but but otherwise, like yeah, yeah. Uh, the favor that the government is doing in issuing treasuries as a, as a safe asset. It's doing that's a favor for capitalists. That's socialism for the rich, by the way. You know, like, so yeah. that's, and it makes yeah. Wall Street function right because they benchmark against that as a stable asset in all their models. Um, you know, we can keep doing that. You know, we don't have to do that. We don't have to do that to get money to pay for public spending, but we can keep doing that. And and there's no reason we have to change it per se from what we're talking about. Yeah, there, there's sort of a, there are a couple of significances, I think, Chris, that people sort of overlook. Uh, significances of, of treasuries and their popularity all over the world as a global reserve asset. So, so one is that they are, to use that phrase that Aaron used a moment ago, safe assets. They're the so-called safe assets par excellence. 
Uh, and the term safe asset is a, a term of art uh, among financiers and in the financial markets. So the basic idea is, you know, all the people who have portfolios, people who have enough money to hold financial portfolios, there's always some particular, some specific portion of the portfolio that is held in the form of so-called safe assets, right? And there's a huge demand for these, right? Uh, and the U.S. Treasury security just is the global reserve safe asset. It's the most demanded one to the point where there's typically more demand for these treasuries than there is supply of them. And that in turn has two very important significances, I think, for our purpose. One is that there's, again, this is another sense in which or another reason that it's true to say that there's not some sort of debt problem that the U.S. is facing or some looming debt crisis. If there's that much more demand for treasuries than there is supply of them, that's just another way of saying that people are dying to borrow to us. People want to lend us more than we even want or need, right? Uh, sort of secondly um, and, and, and relatedly is, you know, it's a great way to determine whether there is inflationary pressure up ahead is to just look at the market for treasuries, look at what the yield on those things is, right? If the yield is low, on treasuries. That's just another way of saying that the borrowing is very inexpensive for us to do. And if that borrowing is really inexpensive for us to do, that suggests, again, that there's a huge demand for our debt, right? More, de more demand than there is supply for it. And you can go even one step further on this, and you can note that Treasury puts out two different kinds of, lots of different kinds, but two kinds salient for our purposes is there's a so-called inflation indexed treasury security, usually referred to as a TIP, that's the acronym TIPS, TIPS. So uh, basically, you know, inflation indexed treasuries basically are treasuries that pay out in a way that takes account of inflation, right? It's effectively, they afford you a kind of inflation protection. And what that means in turn is that if the yield on a, an inflation protected uh, treasury is higher or significantly higher, than the yield on an ordinary treasury, that suggests that the market is anticipating inflation because they're basically buying inflation insurance by buying tips, right? Well, as it happens, the spread between tips and ordinary treasuries has been almost zero for well over a decade now. And that tells you that all these market professionals out there just don't see any inflation on the horizon. So that's another significance, maybe a final significance about the treasury market and the Chinese holdings of treasuries in particular, is that basically the high demand for US treasury debt leads to upward pressure on the dollar. And so the dollar ends up being overvalued as a global currency when it comes to global trade. And that's one reason that we've had these, basically these long sustained, rather remarkably lopsided, so-called current account deficits, better known as trade deficits with certain trading partners. Because if there's high demand for treasuries, there's high demand for the dollars that you use to buy treasuries, that drives up the price of the dollar relative to other currencies. That then makes U.S. goods more expensive. So probably an important piece uh, or part and part of the incoming Biden administration agenda when it comes to monetary policy is going to have to take another look at the role that the, tr the global treasury market is playing in overvaluing the dollar and thus it's saddling American producers and exporters with a disadvantage when it comes to currency values. But that's the opposite of inflation note, right? It's an, an overvalued dollar is the opposite of an inflated dollar, right? So if we've got an overvalued dollar out there, you can't say that at the same time that you say, oh, there's an inflation problem. It's a bit like talking about a round square. You're just talking incoherently if you talk that way. And a lot of weird, you know, money cranks out there basically say both of those things and they can't both be true. There you go. Money cranks. I like that. When I yeah. used... When I, when I was growing up, my father had all these books, and he had great books like Earl Nightingale and Forbes and different things that I read. But he also had a shitload of these books that were like, how to save for the coming doomsday crash. <laughs> and what was funny was he'd buy all the books, and I'd put the books together in stacks, and I'm like, these are the same authors, and they're just reissued every four fucking years. Yeah. And like, the doomsday crash hasn't happened. That's how you save. You, you publish those books. <laughs> there you go. And they're just like, uh, the, it's going to happen next year. It's kind of like, you know, the Seventh-day yeah. Adventists. You know, the world ends on Tuesday. And then yeah, like, oh, I fuck. predicted 10 of the last two crises, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so my, my last question is a big question. It's a loaded question. We want people to go write the, uh, read the, buy the book and read it, of course. Um, but uh, let's see if I can pack all this fucking shit into this, the question. Um, 
how do we get this to work? And I'm hoping the Biden administration will have some new approaches. I feel pretty comfortable that, you know, they did the last rescue and they saw hopefully what didn't work and what did work. And they'll maybe uh, you guys should go talk to them. Um, but how do we make this work in what we have is almost an oligarchy right now. We have unfettered capitalism. I'm an entrepreneur. I love capitalism, but we have unfettered fucking goddamn capitalism. This way out of control in this country between healthcare and everything else. Uh, you know, the works jobs, uh, the value of jobs. I mean, right now the market's up, but you know, t I think today we had another 885,000 people file for unemployment. Um, the, uh, I, you know, uh, uh, so anyway, um, but 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 there is power behind this. It's not just about money. It's not just about. I mean, you guys have this beautiful picture you guys uh, paint in the book of like we should hug everyone and give them money. Um, but there is there is an element to this behind this that is power. I mean, if you read the Prince Machiavellian or different things, there is a certain aspect of control, money, and power. And if I have a lot of it. I really don't want to share it with you very much, and uh, I don't want it to be dissolved. You have organizations like the Betsy DeVos thing, which is, uh, you know, if you study the Betsy DeVos uh, Council on National Policy, I think it is, uh, and the 250 or goddamn whatever PACs that are underneath that thing, their agenda is, is to basically uh, subjugate the American population into indentured servitude, just like colleges have with the, the thing to not pay higher wages and, and to keep that control under the thumb there. We have, uh, politicians that, that, that pander to the donor class, those billionaires, those millionaires and stuff, you know, as long as you've got Mitch McConnell and fucking control, unless something extraordinary happens in Georgia, um, you know, there you go. And even Democrats, I mean, I'm a Democrat, even Democrats play to the donor class a little bit. Um, there is a protection of money and wealth in this thing in, in the perception that it supports the thing. Um, but it's also about power and there's, and there's racism behind that power. Uh, you know, we've talked on the show about how there's certain people that can't get loans at banks or can't get a bank account because they're, you know, they've been raised in poor, maybe ghettos or, or different despondent areas. They don't have credit. They don't have good credit. So they can't get money to spend money, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's one of the arguments that I've saw with the immigrant argument. Everyone's always like, well, immigrants come here and they get, they take money and jobs and they take all of our, they, they take all of our services. And it's like, no, they are, there's actually a net I think it's 86 billion or 68 billion net profit that they put back in the thing. Cause no one ever talks about how they go spend fucking money for goods yeah. and the, you know, the, what goes around comes around rising tide, rides all boats. So how do we fix this shit or adopt to uh, maybe a closer element of what you guys are pitching in the book with all these evil motherfucking people who just want to keep everybody down so they can keep themselves up. Well, yeah, I mean, Bob, Bob has a, We'll have maybe uh, a lot to say about this, but well, this is related to our, the asshole problem of asshole capitalism, right? Is how do you, like once you're, de you're devolved into asshole capitalism, how do you like dig yourself out? It, like, isn't it self-sustaining because greed, you know, greed and malice and entitlement are sort of just self-reinforcing. But I mean, here's, I mean, if you've got a moment like where there's a chance of like of bootstrapping your way out, money talks. So like a great way to change power relations is to throw money at the problem. I mean, if you need things to change um, and there's otherwise like recalcitrant politics, the money incentives really can go a long way. That can work at sort of all these levels. I mean, at the level of like, you need certain, you need a lot of trees planted. You need a grid electrified. You need transportation electrified. You need a, how do you, how do you get people to do all those things? Just pay, pay them. <laughs> oh, okay. That's just my arm. Give me some money at the state or a state level or a city level. Like there's pet projects, like um, someone who's reluctant to do a massive um, energy transformation in their area, in their community or their state or whatever. Right. Well, if they have pet projects, things that they get live with, well, you can have a federal incentive so that they get a lot, they get money for that stuff that they like if they, if they take on the, the new investment uh, regime. So, so like basically legal bribery, can go a long way in power relations. And at the level of Congress, you know, for example, this can work too, because, you know, where people might have been um, reluctant to vote, you know, now there's like people want sort of certain, like there's a lot of in principle support for sort of climate change sorts of stuff. But if there's, you need money to Terry sweeteners, so, so senators or congressmen need to take money home for 
for whatever reason to their states or whatever, you can, well, you throw money at that problem too, right? Um, and that's not a dangerous thing right now because we're not spending enough money. We need to get more money. And if the way to get money into the flowing in the right places is by sort of like legally bribery or horse trading with money, then let, like let the money, let the money flow. Um, that's not, so in some sense, money can help ease anyway, the, the power dynamics and get the power dynamics working in the right uh, right direction, at least with a moment of possibility, like which we potentially have right now. Yeah, just two quick uh, follow on thoughts, uh, Chris. The first is that you know what Aaron was just saying. It, it you can almost look at this as sort of coming full circle, right? We began by noting that the fundamental error that people make about money is to think of it as a fixed quantum, right? The economic term is to say people look at it as exogenous, right? There's an exogenously given stock of it. It's the number of gold rocks or the number of silver bars or whatever, and then that's it. So basically everything is contestation over that fixed sum. And so the game is zero sum to use the game theoretical lingo. But as soon as you realize that that's just not the case, right? That money is, to use the economic term, endogenously generated, not exogenously given in a finite amount, as soon as you realize that, then you realize, well, you don't really have to think of politics as being contestation over some scarce resource that everybody's trying to get their piece of. Instead, we can think of political action as organized activity to grow the stock of wealth and if there's some places where people are under endowed and other places where people are su sufficiently endowed, we just say, well, let's do the growing right now in the areas where people are under endowed. So we're leveling up rather than leveling down. And that makes things a little bit less, you know, kind of nasty. And then secondly, and relatedly, just to get back to this word republic that Aaron and I keep using, people who are familiar with that word tend to think of a republic as a political form, right? It's a form of political organization that you can contrast with various other political forms like an oligarchy, for example. But what seems to have been kind of forgotten is that in its original articulation and theorization by the early Roman Republicans and then the Renaissance, people like Machiavelli and Guardicini and others who sort of revived the Roman Republican tradition, is it's, it's an economic form as well as a political form. That's to say, the ideal of the Republic was that of a polity basically operated by or constituted by people who were roughly equal, right? Not, not, in, in not strictly speaking equal, but at least equal in the sense that they were all basically materially independent. So that then they could participate in public decision making, which is what a Republic does, in, on their own terms, so to speak, rather than as the sort of agents of somebody else on whom they were dependent, right? If you were a peasant dependent on a landlord and then you were engaged in political activity, you'd basically be pushing the interests of your landlord because you're dependent on him or her or landlady, let's say. But the ideal of the Republic was that nobody is a peasant to some landlord. And then that way, everybody is a landlord, so to speak. Everybody is materially independent so that they can be politically independent as well and thus all contribute to that kind of general deliberation that is Republican decision-making and Republican action. Now, one way of looking at what Aaron and I are doing or saying is let's rediscover the economic aspect, aspect of Republicanism and let's put in place the means by which people can be sufficiently materially independent to be citizens so that they're actually participating in politics as themselves rather than as spokespeople for the people who control them or on whom they're dependent. And that, in that sense, our book, again, just is sort of a nice way to close the observation about the book is that's the sense in which it really is a very Republican book, not capital R, but lowercase r. It's really about a republic and it's about rediscovering the monetary and economic aspect of this form of organization to complement the political aspect of this form of organization that some people are at least relatively familiar with. Now, here's the, here's the catch on that. Again, going back to my original question, I'm not re-asking the question, but I'm referencing it, is if you're giving people political freedom or power, mm -hmm. that's something that there's a lot of people in this country don't want. True. Yeah, yeah, so, true. so <laughs> trying to overcome, I mean, the beautiful, what you guys have laid out is beautiful. It makes sense. I mean, even for me, if I was like the Tyson foods billionaire or Elon Musk, I mean, Elon Musk probably really adopted to something like this to a certain degree. Although I don't know. He's starting to really become, um, a, a, a sort of, a, a poly nationalist poly, uh, internationalist globalists where the, you know, these guys, once you read this billionaire static, you don't give a fuck about the U S government or capitalism or anything else anymore. You're just about like 
I'm selling shit. And this is the history of, of what we are. But, but I could look at it from an aspect that if you, Hey, if I can get the government to give people some fucking money, they'll spend more money to buy my shit and I'll get richer. But there also is the con the conversion of that, where a lot of these people think from a scarcity uh, level of like, well, then people will get richer and I might fall a couple notches on the Forbes 100 list, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and then there's, like I said, there's just power, but whether it's uh, races of buying the power or, uh, organizations like Betsy DeVos who want to turn us into a theocracy or, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, that's always what it comes down to money and power, you know? Yeah. Aspect, I mean, I think, I think we wise. agree, but a way, a way of putting it is that we're the, the choice that we're faced with is now is as stark as ever, um, is are, are we going to be a Republic or not? Yeah. Right. And that's the fundamental choice. It's not Republican Party versus Democratic Party. It's not left, right, conservative, Democrat. It, it's Republican or not really. We're saying what it means in, by way of economics yeah. for, and use of money for us to really be a republic. And the people who are resistant to it, yeah, like you're saying, just for power reasons, just to preserve their place high in a hierarchy, are just just don't want a republic. They, they yeah, they're want, the enemy. Yeah, that's yeah. The enemy. You don't want people voting. In structure <laughs> and they're high in the hierarchy, either for yeah. money reasons or race reasons or sex, you know, mm -hmm. and they just want to keep it that way. And so they like the rhetoric of a Republican party and freedom and equal because it legitimates their position and makes it easy to defend arguments and people will do stuff for them, you know, like, or not fight them or try to kill them. <laughs> like, you know, yeah, yeah. Like, it won't threaten their power or whatever, but that really is the choice. Like, are we going to be a Republic or not? Yeah. yeah. There's going to be some, you could almost partition the class of, of, of momentary opponents um, into, into two groups, right? One are those who just haven't thought this stuff. One, one group uh, of, of, of advantaged oligarchs, are probably people who just haven't thought this stuff through and don't realize the entailments of their own legitimate Republican commitments, right? And if you can then explain to them or sort of draw out for them those logical entailments, they'll see, oh yeah, you're right. This is actually gonna be good for me and good for the Republic. It's not what I was thinking because I just wasn't thinking clearly. And there probably are such people, right? Who have who are operating in good faith. They just haven't thought clearly about this stuff. And when you point it all out and draw it out, then they see you're right, and then they're going to act in what we, we used to call their enlightened self-interest, as distinguished from their unenlightened or uninformed or ill-informed self-interest. And I, I suspect there are a lot of those people, right? And Elon Musk could very well be one of them, or at least in the past, he certainly seemed to be, right? And somebody like, uh, what's that guy, Mark Cuban, seemed like that in the past, too, and maybe he still is, right? On the other hand, there are probably some others, like maybe Betsy DeVos is one of them, who they, they know perfectly well what they're doing. And they basically, as Aaron was just describing, they basically are at the top of a hierarchy and they want to stay there. And they understand that an actual republic doesn't have a hierarchy. Uh, and so they're basically anti-Republican or counter-Republican people, but they're perfectly happy using the word Republican, especially the capital R version, because then it sounds like they're paying lip service to something that people can actually cotton on to and, and agree with and affirm, but they're really just lying. Um, and those people, I think, just are the enemy, right? We just have to sort of bite the bullet and say, well, you guys are, you're, bas you're basically a counter-Republican group within our republic. And that means you're a fifth column. And that means you're basically a kind of unwelcome parasitic presence. And our job as actual citizens of a republic is in effect to quarantine you, to sort of cordon sanity, you put in, erect a kind of cordon sanitaire to ensure that you're not able to exercise influence of a counter Republican sort. And there's a sense in which our constitution itself validates our doing this if we decide to do it. People don't talk, you know, one of the forgotten clauses of the constitution until recently, and even, even now that it's being remembered, it's unfortunately being remembered by the wrong people, is a clause referred to as the guarantee clause. And the guarantee clause puts upon the federal government a responsibility to guarantee to all the states a quote, Republican form of government. Now back in the 18th century, when that word Republican with a small r was used, they were referring specifically to what Aaron and I are referring to. They were re referring to the Roman Republican tradition, the pre-imperial Roman Republic, where citizens were rough equals and citizens all were, again, materially independent and thus capable of being responsible citizens. So there's a sense in which we are committed, even by our own constitution, to being a republic in that full economic and political sense that Aaron and I are trying to recover and to advance. And insofar as that's the case, then if somebody like Betsy DeVos is just literally against Republican government, 
she's against our constitution. And she's in that sense, a kind of enemy to the United States. And I don't want to sound paranoid and say that, say, therefore let's throw her in Guantanamo Bay, which is a, a very anti-Republican institution. Um, but it is to say that we don't have to listen to that shit, that, uh, that the crap that she says. We can say, no, you're in the wrong country for that. This is a republic, right? That's not something that we recognize. What you're pushing here is alien to our fundamental values, that which constitutes us as a polity, hence the word constitution. There you go. There you go. Anything you want to throw in there, Aaron, before I wrap? No, that's good. Thanks. That's a nice sum up. Yeah. There you go. Uh, and I like that sum up because it puts me right into this is an important reason to buy the book, read about it, educate yourself, educate your friends, relatives around you, use it as a gift for Christmas. Christmas is around the corner as well. Uh, and uh, get to know what's going on in, in our society. You know, one of the things that I've really been exploring in my head, and of course, a lot of great authors like yourselves that we've had on, is how this ultra class. Uh, this, these billionaire classes, they use the scarcity element. They, they control, you know, through super PACs and everything else they do, the Betsy DeVos designs and things. And we, we've, had a lot, we've had a lot of this Wizard of Oz crap peeled away in the last four years where we've realized what's going on behind the scenes. But uh, uh, this is a really important aspect to re read the book and educate yourself because I see so many of these people that run around and they parrot shit and they're just average broke citizens and they parrot like, oh, we don't need to pay $15 an hour. That's socialism and communism. Or, yeah, I'm for big, I'm for less government and less regulations. And you're like, do you understand that that puts lead in your fucking water? But what it does for Betsy DeVos, Elon Musk, or all these, you know, neo uh, globalists, whatever, um, it makes it so they don't have regulations. You know, we're seeing right now uh, Mitch McConnell's trying to make it so that Tyson Foods and all those companies that bragged and took jokes and bets about how many people would die with coronavirus in their fucking facilities. I think there's like, I can't remember the figure, but there's a thousands figure right now of, of open lawsuits that are out there. And he's trying to appeal to his donor class and block these lawsuits with legislation and stuff. And they're doing it just to take rich people. And the average American doesn't sit around that, that parrots that bullshit and realizes that it's to fuck them and that they are at the dentured servitude of these, 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 you know, this billionaire classes that are like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> let's, uh, regulations are bad because I, I could go up a couple more digits on the Forbes 100 list, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's my wrap on that, guys. Check out the book. Um, thanks for guys for being on the show. This is a brilliant discussion we've had, Robert and Aaron. Thank you guys. It's been a joy, Chris. Thanks so thanks, much. Chris. Thanks, thanks so much. Very much. Thanks. So, and, and hopefully everyone learns something. Order the book up. You can get it from a lot of different places. Money from nothing or why we should stop worrying about the debt and learn to love the Federal Reserve. Give us your plugs if you guys got any dot coms you want people to go check out. Well, uh, you could just, I mean, if you Google either of our names, um, certainly if you Google my name, you'll find a lot of stuff out there. Um, and if you Google the book's title, you'll find a lot of stuff. And then, Aaron, I think you have a whole on assholes website too, right? Yeah, that's. I haven't updated that much recently, but there's plenty of assholes content out there. Or the documentary is widely available on platforms uh, for watch. So that's a that's a quick way to get up to speed on assholes. And then, of course, buy the book as well if you want, uh, or buy our money book for the full for what to do about the asshole problem. Right? Is, <laughs> is you can do a boolean, a boolean with an or or an and. Right? Google both <laughs> of our names with an and, and you'll get tons of money for nothing or money from nothing okay. stuff. Uh, and then do us or, and you'll get a ton of related stuff that we've each been doing for, for ages. Yeah. yeah. There you go. There you go. I, I love the assholes movie, by the way, I watched it. And what was funny is it tied into some other authors we have came on where we talked about fascism and, uh, Silvio, Silvio, uh, Berlusconi. Berlusconi. Yeah. I was have trouble with that name, but, uh, it talked about him and some of the different things and really tied into a lot of, uh, issues we're doing. Yeah. So check out the movie as well, guys. Thanks to my honors for tuning in, pick up the book money for nothing, uh, or your chicks for free or something. I don't know. Uh, there you go. Uh, guys, thanks for being here. Go to youtube.com for just Chris Foss to see the video version of this. Follow us at facebook.com, the Chris Foss show. Uh, follow the groups over there and also on LinkedIn as well. There's a show page uh, on the LinkedIn as well. Uh, also go to goodreads.com for Josh Chris Voss and uh, the cvpn.show for their friends your uh, show to your friends neighbors relatives we'll have some lighter shows over uh, the holidays seems like a lot of authors want to be interviewed uh, in the new year we've got January book solid 
Uh, but there are 700 shows you can go back and listen to on the Chris Foss show. Go back and listen to those shows. They're excellent. I see people, we have these old downloads, the hundreds of shows back that people go and, and engage and they'll be like, where the hell is, what, what the hell is going on back there? So go search the shows. You can find all sorts of great things. Watch those shows. We bang the crap out of old content. So we certainly appreciate you guys tuning in. Wear your mask, stay safe. Happy holidays. We'll see you next time.